This is Tell Me What to Read, the podcast of booktopia.com.au. I'm Nick Vasiliev, and I'm delighted to be back for another special book discussion episode. But in today's episode, uh, it's going to be an especially interesting topic because we're not just delving into the world of books, but we're de- delving into the world of painting, portraits, and art as well. The National Portrait Gallery in Canberra has just launched an incredible new exhibition, Shakespeare to Winehouse, Icons from National Portrait Gallery in London. This incredible collection features over 80 portraits of some of the most incredible artists, politicians, sports stars, scientists, and of course, authors, that both the United Kingdom and also the world in general has to offer. From Darwin to Dickens, the Beatles, the Bronte sisters, and Beckham, the National Portrait Gallery, Um, holds some of the most um, extensive collection of portraits. And here to talk about it today is Joanna Gilmore, curator and researcher at the National Portrait Gallery. Joanna, welcome to Tell Me What to Read. Good morning, Nick. It's lovely to speak with you. It's great to have you on. And for all of our listeners, I've included a link to a landing, a special landing page that we have on booktopia.com.au, which links to several of the books that we do with the National Portrait Gallery. Um, Having a look at this at this collection, Joanna, just my first thoughts are just wow. <laughs> <laughs> Every single portrait here is incredible. Every person is a household name in their respective field. How the hell did the National Portrait, Portrait Gallery manage to acquire such an incredible collection? Well, God, I wish we had acquired them. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, uh, we, we've only got them temporarily. But uh, as you mentioned at the outset, it's a, a touring exhibition which has come to us from the National Portrait Gallery in London. And a lot of people uh, may be aware that National Portrait Galleries, as a general rule, are fairly rare entities. <laughs> There's not many of us in the world. And London is the first, it's sort of the the mothership for the rest of us, as I like to think of it. And so for that reason, the National Portrait Gallery in Canberra, even though we're a much younger institution than NPG London, which was founded in the 1850s, we have always obviously had a a really sort of strong affinity with them. Uh, We've worked with them on a number of exhibitions, traveling exhibitions previously. So I guess, yeah, we've got a a really good and sort of understandable (laughs) relationship with NPG London anyway. So there's that. That's what's sort of one of the reasons why when this touring exhibition became available, we were sort of one of the obvious uh, possible venues. It's been to a couple of venues before it came to Australia. It was in South Korea for a while and also at an art museum in the Netherlands. Uh, But the the other sort of main thing I think to point out is that NPG London uh, for the past couple of years has been closed. So they're they're undergoing a a major sort of redevelopment exercise, which is, you know, not so great if you're in London and wanting to see these things, but fantastic if you're elsewhere in the world because (laughs) the exhibition among those 84 portraits that are are in the show are works that ordinarily you would have to go to London to see. And I'm thinking here in particular of uh, paintings such as the the painting of of William Shakespeare. Mm. It's believed to be of William Shakespeare. It's kind of uh, subject to quite a bit of debate, but uh, that's a work which has a a very good claim to being uh, the only portrait of Shakespeare that he actually sat for and was painted sort of during his lifetime. Uh, And it's, uh, among other things, it's the very first painting that NPG London acquired when they opened in 1856. So it is a real sort of icon for all sorts of multiple (laughs) reasons. And the sort of thing, I think, once it's back on the walls in London, when uh, NPG London reopens next year, it'll be a long time, if ever, before it travels again. Certainly, uh, it'll be a, a good while before it travels as far as Australia. Mm, and it's, it's the, you know the first time that painting has ever been here, uh, as mm. far as I know. So there, are, yeah, there are real treasures of of London's collection. Uh, one of my favourite works in the show, which we'll probably talk about, I suspect at length, is a a painting of the Bronte sisters, Emily and mm. Anne and Charlotte Bronte, which is the only known portrait of the three of them together. There's there's some fabulous self portraits, an absolutely wonderful self portrait by Sir Anthony Van Dyke from uh, 1640, made not long before he died. There's just some really fabulous treasures. Mm. Um, yeah, and it will be. It, I, I can't imagine NPG London relinquishing them again <laughs> for a little while. <laughs> well, I mean, with a, with a with a, a, a 
collection this extensive, uh, uh, you'd, you would want to hold on to it. And so it's very lucky that uh, that the National Portrait Gallery in Canberra can 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 hold on to them at least for a few months. So give us a sense of, of the timeline that these that all of these portraits cover, because it is quite extensive, isn't it? It is, yeah. So uh, just to give you a, a kind of an idea, NPG London's collection is it's over two hundred thousand works strong. Mm. Uh, so it's it's pretty comprehensive. It's the biggest uh, portraiture collection in the world. Uh, and as I mentioned, the NPG in London is the first of the very few museums in the world that are specifically uh, focused on portraiture. Mm -hmm. uh, but they've distilled that 200,000 works down into, uh, for this exhibition, a selection of 84 works. Uh, and it not only covers all sorts of different types of sitters, but all sorts of different mediums. So there's painting, obviously, but also fabulous photography and sculpture, some digital work. Uh, there's a holographic portrait of Queen Elizabeth II, which is pretty fantastic. Uh, so, yeah, a diverse range of mediums, all sorts of different artists. Uh, like you said, there's uh, international figures as well as sort of famous, famous British names. Uh, and, yeah, an incredible date span. So we've got everything from uh, panel paintings from the 16th century. So the earliest work in the show is a, a painting made in 1559. Wow. And the most recent work in the exhibition is this absolutely stunning photograph, huge, beautiful photograph of Malala Yousafzai, which was commissioned by NPG London in 2018. So, mm -hmm. yeah, it's it's almost 500 years worth, not just of, of British history and world history, but 500 years worth of art and the art of portraiture specifically. It's... It I'm personally so excited to go and check it out myself because I'll, I'll be down in Canberra in, in June to, and I'll uh, you, just reading up about it has made me excited. But before I dive into the actual, uh, the, the, the subjects of the actual pictures themselves, you mentioned the, the many styles, the many different, yeah. uh, the, the many different painters and photographers here. And I'd love to ask, uh, you know, about some of the painters and, and the artists themselves, if I can, mm -hmm. you know, while, while there are, you know, there are many great names here, the, the the painters and artists themselves to even have the chance to sit down with some of these figures would you know all you know have to be extremely accomplished in their own right um even you know household names themselves what sort of styles do we cover is it just a case of everything every single uh, portrait style under the sun and who are some of the famous painters that really stand out in this exhibition well i think for me being someone who is into art history, one of the, the really lovely things about the exhibition is that it's not just uh, an exhibition of images of famous subjects. It's, it's an exhibition of, it's kind of like this, uh, this beautiful encapsulation of 500 years of, of the history of British art just mm. in, in 84 works. So it's really quite amazing. And it takes you through, uh, you've got artists exemplifying each of these sort of major developments and major shifts in British painting and so looking at the very very early sort of end of the exhibition the 16th and early uh, 17th century material you've got artists such as uh, Nicholas Hilliard uh, and he is the artist who uh, is believed or is associated with the portrait of Queen Elizabeth I which is in the exhibition painted in the, the 1570s and there's a number of other works from from that sort of era there's a fabulous picture of uh, Sir Walter Raleigh in the show mm. uh, also a wonderful painting of Queen Elizabeth's dad Henry VIII <laughs> so they're side by side on the wall and if you know anything about uh, sort of 16th century British painting you'll know that often these figures were portrayed in a very uh, very detailed uh, almost sort of um, iconic they were painted as if they were sort of altarpieces or mm. just icons so you know you might look at these paintings now and think oh well actually they haven't painted that hand very well or modeled the face very well it doesn't really look <laughs> like a living breathing person but the detail in the works is absolutely exquisite and obviously these paintings of people like Queen Elizabeth I were very much all about projecting particular messages so you know the painting of the 1570s of Queen Elizabeth I Hilliard's painting if it is Hilliard we believe it he's associated with it is very much a work that was made at the time that you know she had given up sort of all 
uh, pretense of, of looking for a husband. She was a woman and a ruler and queen in her own right. And so it's a, a, a portrait which very much projects her authority and her defiance and her power, I suppose. Mm. And for that reason, the artists who've created it have paid a great deal of attention to the, the just spectacular gown that she's wearing, the absolutely amazing jewellery. Uh, she's wearing this, this uh, dress which is embroidered all with gold mm. and then there's hundreds and hundreds of pearls sort of stitched onto it. So, And each of those pearls and each of those gold threads is like painstakingly <laughs> delineated. <laughs> so you, you get this sense of, artists who were working in very controlled circumstances. You couldn't just sort of, it wasn't, but making a portrait in the 1570s wasn't about you as an artist and your creativity and your ideas and your style. You had to sort of stick to a, a code mm. <laughs> because your client had very sort of specific purpose in mind for the portrait that you were creating of them. And this is a time when, you know, people are getting their heads cut off and all of that sort of <laughs> stuff. So if you're an artist and you're making a portrait for the Queen, you want to, you know, you know, you want to do a really good job. You don't want to end up in the Tower of London because you've made her, you know, <laughs> you've done a bad job or she's sort of somewhat dissatisfied with the result. Mm. So yeah, like I say, you get this sense of these very kind of uh, artists working in very sort of controlled kind of circumstances it not being uh it not being uh, a genre which was about one's own sort of personal style or individuality as an artist mm. and then you get this kind of massive shift and this is represented in the exhibition as well around about the time that king charles the first comes uh comes to power so this is uh in the 17th century and you have artists like Rubens and Van Dyck, so artists from uh, what, is, what is now Germany and also the Netherlands and, and Belgium who uh, bring with them to England the influence of what was going on elsewhere in Europe, in particular Italy. So uh, an artist like Van Dyck, who's there's a couple of paintings of his in the exhibition, you can really see with him how there's this, this bravura uh, his handling of paint, his his confidence, <laughs> uh, this sort of whole injection of individuality, I guess, comes into comes into play in portraiture with the arrival of artists like Van Dyck and Rubens in the 17th century. And you see just sort of within the space of the exhibition, you can see the shift from these very, um, some would say sort of wooden or flat or doll-like kind of representations of people to these figures who uh, are, you know, flesh and blood individuals, they have character, they have personality. And someone like Van Dyck, you know, he was very influenced by uh, artists like Leonardo da Vinci, for example, who, mm. as we know, spent a lot of time studying uh, anatomical drawings. And so the, you know, the musculature and the, the way that Van Dyck, uh, paints people is much more vivacious it's it's much more sort of lifelike so there's these incredible shifts and then when you get to the 18th century and also represented in the exhibition are artists like Joshua Reynolds and uh, Thomas Gainsborough who once again are taking on that sort of they they take up that mantle of the the bravura the sort of celebrity artist I suppose this incredibly confident grand, uh, beautiful, uh, somewhat, somewhat, some might say sort of over the top, but this really uh, like a, yeah, confident and sophisticated sort of way of painting. And, and that just sort of keeps carrying through, right? The whole, mm. right, the whole um, exhibition, we've got a number of, there's three works in the show by Sir Thomas Lawrence, who is the guy who sort of takes up from Gainsborough and Reynolds. And once again, this incredibly confident painter uh, two works of his from uh, the late 1820s, which are, in interestingly enough, they're unfinished. One's a portrait of the Duke of Wellington and, and another is a, a portrait of William Wilberforce, the statesman who led the campaign for the abolition of slavery in mm. the British Empire. Uh, and Lawrence started working on those uh, not long before he died. So they're both unfinished. But you can see, this, because they're unfinished, it's actually 
they're better for being unfinished because you can see the way that Lawrence worked. His process. Yeah, yeah his process. And you can see, A, well, how incredibly talented he was at conveying uh, the face and the features and the, the sort of character of a face because the, the faces in these two portraits are complete but everything else is just sort of still sketched in. Mm. But you can see the way that, you know, he was obviously so confident that he didn't bother doing preparatory drawings on paper that were transferred onto canvas. He drew directly onto a primed canvas with with chalk or, or charcoal. So it's mm. this, and the, the effect of um, the unfinished parts of the paintings means that you're really sort of focused in on the faces of the subjects and it, it's, they're really quite exquisite. Yeah, it really quite. Uh, wonderful demonstrations of what a talented painter he was. Mm. And I'd imagine all of this expression, not of the or kind of, of the artist putting themselves into the into the portrait of, of their subjects continues into, you know, when you have Warhol turning up and, exactly. uh, yeah. and, and he and, the, and it brings a particular style. Someone identifies that it's no longer just about the the subject of the portrait. It's the fact that it's the subject of the portrait, but they're in a Warhol Precisely. Um, piece of, um, you know, uh, artwork or, 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 photo or photograph or whatever. It, that's, that is where the element comes in. That it, exactly. it, the style yeah. changes even further. And interestingly enough, that starts very early on. That's not like a, a recent or a 20th mm. century kind of phenomenon. Um, someone like Van Dyck or even Hans Holbein, who was um, Henry VIII's sort of favourite painter, to have them paint you, that was a, that was a thing, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Uh, so it's it's artists uh, particularly, and I, I think Thomas Lawrence is a really good example of that. It wasn't just about having yourself painted; it was about having yourself painted by him. Yeah. And indeed, the the picture of the Duke of Wellington that's in the exhibition, Lawrence's picture of the Duke of Wellington, uh, like I say, it was unfinished. And after Lawrence's death, uh, his uh, executors contacted the lady who had commissioned the portrait of Wellington and said, look, we'll get one of his studio assistants to finish it because it's not finished yet, you know. Mm. And the, the patron who commissioned it would not allow it to be touched. It could only be Lawrence's hands <laughs> <laughs> that had worked on the, on the painting. No one else was allowed to finish it off because they just weren't, they weren't him. They weren't mm. you know, good enough. So, yeah, and you're right. There's all sorts of, I mean, I've only just mentioned a handful of British artists but there's some you know pretty major international names in the exhibition mm. as well people like Auguste Rodin uh there's Rubens of course Andy Warhol who you mentioned some really fabulous photographers as well uh mm -hmm. Lou Miller Richard Avedon uh Cecil Beaton famous British photographer and, and David Bailey another British photographer who's kind of synonymous with the swinging 60s in London mm. so yeah there's it's just a it's a fa like I say, I guess <laughs> in short, it's a it's a fabulous art historical thing as well as a fabulous uh, social historical. Yeah, program. and as also just as a place not just to to highlight the figures themselves, but the progression of of many art forms in many styles, uh, um, you know, within one exhibition, which which is like you say, the stuff like this doesn't come along very often. Um, right. <laughs> I know you've already kind of, you may have already touched on this because I, I'm aware that, you know, we have 84 pieces of artwork and there's no way we can cover it in one, in one, you know, 45 minute podcast, but you've, you've touched on a few and I want to kind of ask you a bit more about, you know, your favorites um, uh -huh. of this, of this exhibition. What are the ones that kind of really stand out to you and really make you go, wow, the, you know, this is, it's, it's taught me or, or, you know, given me a piece of knowledge that I didn't have previously from, from looking at this exhibition. Gosh, that's a really hard question. <laughs> I, think, uh, I think the thing about the exhibition, which I haven't mentioned yet, is that it's the other thing about it is that it's not just that you get to see these things, but you get to see them as they're not normally shown when they're in London. So rather than normally, if you see, go to MPG London and you look at their collection, it's arranged chronologically. So, and that's, you know, a fairly sort of standard practice for portrait galleries is to, create a timeline of history using using portraits but with this exhibition they've done away with the chronology and the whole exhibition is grouped thematically so it's kind of like there's six six themes which are intrinsic to portraiture and which persist in portraiture across 500 years 
And so it's almost as if you're seeing six kind of mini exhibitions in one. So I'm afraid if you're going to ask me what my favourite is, I've got a favourite <laughs> in the exhibition. <laughs> Which I'm I worried it was a pointed question. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so the first of the themes is is fame and which you know fairly obvious kind of thing to associate with portraiture and I think in that respect my fa my favorite in that section at the moment it changes from week to week <laughs> but my favorite at the moment is a, a portrait of a, a woman named Nell Gwynne by an artist named uh, Simon Verrells it was painted in the late 17th century about 1680 and Nell is an amazing character. She's sort of best known as an actress, uh, but she was also a quite a scandalous person at the time. She was uh, someone who was in a long-standing relationship with uh, King Charles II. She was one of his uh, several mistresses, had a couple of kids with him. Uh, and she was also someone who very much was aware of her own beauty and her own notoriety. And she very much is playing up her sort of scandalous persona in this portrait. It's really quite wonderful. Uh, and then the second of the six themes is identity. And I think, I mean, beyond the portrait of the Bronte sisters, which is also in that theme, my sort of next favorite in the identity theme is uh, a portrait of Radcliffe Hall, a writer, another writer, mm. uh, painted in about 1918. Uh, and Radcliffe Hall, of course, is very famous as the, the author of a novel called The Well of Loneliness, uh, a, a novel which for the time was very courageous, uh, very brave in that it, it very frankly, and it's semi-autobiographical. And uh, the novel talks about uh, the relationship, a same-sex relationship between two women, of course, and published at a time uh, when homosexuality was still illegal. And, and indeed, the book was banned for many mm. years for that reason. Uh, then the third theme of the exhibition is all about self-portraiture and that there's just about every work in that exhibition, in that section of the show is a favourite of mine. But I think uh, of all of them, I'd have to point to a self-portrait by an artist named Angelica Kaufman, uh, painted in the 1770s. And Angelica Kaufman is an extraordinary lady for a lot, lots of reasons, not least of which is that she was one of the first two women admitted to the Royal Academy of Arts in London in the late 1760s when it was founded. Then there's a section uh, called Love and Loss. Mm -hmm. And once again, that's another very obvious kind of uh, thing in portraiture. Portraits are often painted because we fancy someone or because we really miss someone or as a memento of someone that we've lost. But in that section, once again, it's a really good <laughs> the exhibition, but there's a, a lovely painting of uh, Princess Elizabeth, who was the uh, the daughter of King James the First, so she was mm. King Charles the First's sister, younger sister, uh, and it's a painting of her made when she's about fourteen years old, and it's an example of that practice that they had of oh, you need to find a husband for your daughter, get an artist to come and paint a picture of her, make her look sort of very rich and very desirable and very beautiful, and then you send that painting off around mm. on tour for any sort of prospective suitors so that's mm. a it's a, a fabulous example of, of that sort of portraiture and then there's a section of the exhibition which is about innovation so it really looks at the way that even though portraiture is often sort of thought of as a very sort of staid and traditional and quite conservative genre it's a genre which unsurprisingly <laughs> has always been subject to to innovation you know, so even artists in the 17th century like Rubens and Van Dyck were introducing uh, innovations. They were very, very ahead of their times, even though you don't necessarily know it. Mm. <laughs> you don't sort of necessarily think that way now. So um, this innovation section looks at the way that all sorts of uh, styles of art can be applied to portraiture. And I'm thinking in particular here of a fabulous picture of the poet T.S. Eliot, which is a cubist sort of portrait. You see him. Uh, in profile and full on, like uh, front on. So both uh, angles or both aspects of him combined into the same image. It's a really wonderful work from the late 1940s. Mm -hmm. And then the final section of the exhibition is, uh, is about power. And there's so many great works in that section. So the, mm -hmm. the portrait of Queen Elizabeth I that I mentioned is in there. There's an excellent photograph of Dame Vivian Westwood by a British photographer named Martin Parr. 
uh, Malala Yousafzai is in that section of the exhibition. It's it's really hard to pick a, fa a favourite from the, the power room. <laughs> well, you've definitely definitely done a great job of, of trying to condense this, trying to condense all those uh, all those artworks down. And I do not blame you for having multiple multiple favourites across all of them. Um, of course, mentioning as mentioned as a, as a book podcast, I'm immediately gravitating towards the collection around the authors and the poets. Mm -hmm. I love that you have that. There's Eliot. Um, that yep. is on a personal level. I think he's an incredible poet, and just to see a cubist, but um, mm -hmm. one is one I'm particularly excited for. But there's also, you know, your Charles Dickenses. You mentioned the Bronte sisters, of course. You yep. you mentioned a, a certain William Shakespeare That's um, right, as yes. well. Um, who are some of the uh, incredible authors uh, that any of the bibliophiles in our in our pod, in our audience will be listening uh, would be interested in, in checking out in this exhibition? Well, uh, in addition to T.S. Eliot, there's a, a beautiful photograph of W.H. Auden uh, that's by Richard Avedon, and it's a, a photograph of him standing on a, a snowy street in New York. Really lovely photo. There's also a really beautiful painting of Dylan Thomas painted by Augustus John. Um, so that was, you know, I liked having a, another excuse to, to listen to Under Milkwood. That was <laughs> really kind of pleasing to me. Uh, oh, there's Radcliffe Hall, who I mentioned. There's a, a really lovely, uh, for anyone who has children or who is a fan of, of Beatrix Potter, there's a, a wonderful painting of Beatrix Potter in the exhibition. It's her as, a, oh, wow. as an elderly lady. Uh, painted by her neighbour, so not a, a famous artist by any means. But uh, so it's a work which really speaks to her, um, not just as a, a lover of, of, of nature, but uh, as someone who was a very uh, kind of strident conservationist in a way and a strident advocate for the, the preservation of uh, agricultural heritage. So she's, uh, she's depicted and in the background you can see she's at some sort of a a sheep shearing or a, a sheep judging kind of event and the the mm. sheep the breed of sheep in the background is is one that she herself sort of uh advocated for the um the sort of preservation of <laughs> if you will and she's in this beautiful kind of northumbrian landscape and she was a farmer as well as a, a writer and a, a landowner she was a uh, an early supporter of the national trust in the uk so you get a, a sense of this uh, this kind of lovely, uh, wise lady. Mm. <laughs> and she's all sort of rugged up in a, a nice warm coat. And, yeah, it's that's a fabulous portrait. Um, there's a wonderful picture of uh, Henry James, the American-born writer. And this, this is a, this is a, a portrait with a, a fabulous story attached to it, mm. which I can tell you if you think we've got time. <laughs> <laughs> uh but in short, it's a, a painting of Henry James by another American-born artist, John Singer Sargent, which was exhibited at the Royal Academy in 1914. So it was exhibited at a time when uh, the suffragette movement in, in the UK was getting quite militant, bearing in mind that it wasn't until the early 1920s that women in, in the UK were uh, given the vote. Mm. Uh, and because the painting of uh, Henry James was in the Royal Academy and hung at sort of a, it was like they used to talk about paintings in the Academy being hung on the line, which means it was hung uh, at eye level effectively. Mm. So if, if you've seen pictures of Royal Academy exhibitions from the 19th century or the early 20th century, you'll probably know that they used to just hang paintings all the way up the wall, this kind of floor to ceiling installation of work. So if you, <laughs> If you had your painting hung on the line, that was a really good thing. It meant that the critics would see <laughs> your painting before they'd see others and all of that sort of stuff. But the downside of having your painting at, at, at that level on the wall meant that it was easy for someone to have a go at it mm. if they chose to. And in the case of the Henry James picture in 1914, uh, an elderly suffragette <laughs> named Mary Edwards decided she smuggled um, a little... Uh, meat cleaver into the <laughs> into the exhibition in her handbag or under her coat or something and she took to uh, the picture of Henry James with said meat cleaver and did a whole lot of damage smashed the glass <laughs> oh my god cut into the canvas quite quite dramatically such that uh, Henry the sergeant had to come and pick the pick the painting up from the exhibition, take it back to his studio, patch it up, repaint all the bits that she'd 
hacked into. And she herself, uh, of course, went to, to trial and was actually sentenced to a, a custodial sentence for having attacked uh, the painting of Henry James. So, uh, and to look at the work, you wouldn't, you can apparently still see, we're told that it is still possible to see the damage that she did to the canvas, not that you can, <laughs> you can see it um, very clearly, but yeah, it's, it's, a, it's an incredible, it's a fantastic painting. Mm. Um, but yeah, also a really fantastic story attached. I have, yeah, I, I, I have to, I'm going to have to come and, ch and, and check this out and, and try and find the, uh, the damage that this, <laughs> the, the, the hacks with the meat cleaver that she made uh, into this, into this, um, into this painting, um, into this you know, <laughs> piece of work. What a, what a great story to accompany it. Um, <laughs> for, for all of our, our listeners, um, as you mentioned at the top of the, of the show, uh, the, the gallery, it's only for a limited time. How long do, does the National Portrait Gallery have this incredible exhibition till? Until the 17th of July. Yeah. Mm, fantastic. Well, for all of our listeners, you should definitely go and check it out. Um, you should definitely go and, uh, and and grab a copy. Oh, grab a copy. Sorry, force of habit from, from saying that about books. You should definitely go and purchase a ticket uh, from, from the National Portrait Gallery and get along to see... Uh, this incredible collection um, because uh, judging by all the stories and all the artworks, there is so much stuff to dig up and so much that every person, no matter their interest, can enjoy, which is particularly wonderful. Um, we'll move on to the second part of the show, uh, which where we talk, where we usually invite our guests to bring along books uh, that they have been reading and enjoying. And, and Joanna, I'm, I'm particularly excited because your books that you've mentioned uh, are going uh, kind of directly related in some ways to this to this exhibition, um, what are some of the books that you have, you kind of have been reading and that you've uh, been enjoying as a result? Well, it's sort of a bit of an occupational hazard, I think. Is it? <laughs> <laughs> you have to do a lot of reading, but I've really loved working on this particular project because it's it's enabled me to read a lot of my favourite things with impunity. So I'm a mm. I'm a massive fan of nineteenth century fiction. <laughs> and I mentioned the Bronte sisters. I've, I don't know how many times I've mentioned the Bronte <laughs> sisters already, but uh, the painting, I mean, there's a whole lot of reasons why I really love the portrait of them that's in the exhibition. Mm -hmm. And to give you a bit of background, it's painted in about 1834. The artist who created the work is their brother, Branwell, uh, who wasn't by any means an accomplished artist so when you you see this picture uh you probably a lot of people would maybe think oh, hang on what is a such an amateur kind of crappy looking painting doing in something like the national portrait gallery in london so it's it's a work which really sort of uh goes against the perceptions or the misconceptions that people might have or the expectations that people might have of, mm. of an institution calling it a national calling itself a national portrait gallery but I think what I it's it's actually the fact that it is amateur that it's it is quite damaged it somehow makes it so much more powerful and so much more uh, eloquent in terms of speaking to the Brontes themselves and, mm. and the way that they worked and their their creativity and the way these amazing, incredible novels <laughs> mm. uh, just seem, seem to have come out of nowhere. But it, this painting just really kind of gives you a, a sense of, of the four of them, not just the three sisters, but Bramwell as well, having been engaged from a very young age in sort of uh, creating these kind of fantastical uh fictional and imaginary worlds they all collaborated on these mm. sort of creative projects from the time they were children and the other sort of thing to mention about the portrait when you see it it's it is quite alarming not just because it's it's not a particularly uh accomplished or professional <laughs> looking painting but because it is very damaged and that's because uh for many years it was thought to have just you know been discarded uh, but it turned up in the early 20th century. In, in 1914, it turned up uh, in, a, in a house and it was folded up. It was taken out of its frame and off its stretcher and it was folded up and gathering dust on top of a cupboard. Mm. And so when it was discovered and they discovered what it was, it had all of this damage done. So there are big crease marks uh, sort of right down the centre and, and right <laughs> across the middle. There are all sorts of bits where... Um, 
you can see that where these pieces of paint have chipped off. Uh, there's uh, the, this figure sort of in the, the centre background, which is thought to have been, is thought to be a, a self-portrait by Branwell, the artist. Mm. But for whatever reason, he wasn't very happy with the way that <laughs> he, or he had second thoughts about having put himself into the composition. So he's painted himself out and made mm. himself look like a kind of a classical uh, kind of a pillar mm. or a column in the background behind his his three sisters. So it's like I say, it's just a, a very, very unexpected painting, but in its its humility and its its honesty, I think it's it's just incredibly powerful. And that's um I think something that very much sort of puts me in mind of Jane Eyre, which is easily mm. one of my favourite novels ever, if if not my possibly my favourite nineteenth century <laughs> British novel. Mm. So um, I I I I, I read Jane Eyre. I try to read it quite regularly. Uh, like it's there's a couple of things. I, I also try to read Middlemarch, um, George Eliot's novel, relatively mm. regularly. So uh, to have this painting coming to the gallery was like, oh well, I might as well read Jane Eyre again, which I did. <laughs> <laughs> it's and, and did it did it make you look at the out of curiosity? Because I imagine it'd be a very unique very unique experience to to you know to have this artwork of the the actual author in front of you but you're reading you're a fan of her of her work you know of their mm-hmm. not just her all of their work specifically yeah. does it does it make you recontextualize looking at Jane Eyre and, and you suddenly feel either, I don't know say a bit closer or do you look at the actual context of it and view it in a different way that you wouldn't have previously if you if you had just read the book I think so because um, in, in my case, and NPG London actually have a, a a little drawing of Jane Austen, which unfortunately isn't in the exhibition. I'm kind of wishing it was. But oh, if only, <laughs> gosh. It, um, it's, it's a little bit like the Bronte sisters' portrait in that it's the only known portrait of, uh, of Jane Austen from life and it was thought to have been drawn by her sister, Cassandra, who once again wasn't uh, an accomplished artist by any means so it is quite an amateur um, and sort of seemingly in, inconsequential little work but to me both those works the portrait of Austen and also this picture of Emily and Anne and Charlotte Bronte it just sort of says it seems to say to I don't know it's given me an even more uh profound I guess sort of appreciation of who they were it's like it, it's greatly increased my admiration for them because there's there's something about the nature of these portraits Mm. that really indicates that they you know they had a lot of struggles to overcome just to be able to get published and for them to have you know just stuck at it and kept writing even though they weren't university educated they were women they weren't allowed to go to university even Mm. if they they what they wanted to uh they weren't from a wealthy background you know so the the Brontes father he was from he was from a very poor family in Ireland but nevertheless you know managed to get himself to Cambridge and to to study for the church and uh instilled in his children uh uh you know a love and an appreciation of education that enabled them to sort of have these incredibly vivid creative lives Mm. Uh, so you just I think get a sense from these portraits of how gendered society was. And of course, uh, Emily and Anne and Charlotte Bronte's first novels, of course, all had to be uh, published under assumed male names. Mm. (laughs) Uh, And that was, you know, part of the sensation of them when it was discovered that something like Wuthering Heights uh, was written by, you know, a young woman that was, you know, there was outrage. How dare a, a, you know, genteel young woman be writing about these kind of vengeful violent (laughs) passionate people and you know hanging out with ghosts and ranging around the moors looking for ghosts and all of this sort of stuff so yeah it's just I think there's something so telling about the portraits it it really demonstrates like I say demonstrates to you how closed these sort of avenues were Mm. the women of their sort of class and their Mm. Um, their their standing and it's really interesting thing because there's a the portrait of Dickens that's in the exhibition uh, which is also from the 1830s is a 
a portrait of him that was commissioned by his publishers to be engraved as the frontispiece for the book edition of Nicholas Nickleby, which um, came out in 1839. And mm. to contrast this portrait of, of Dickens by a professional artist, and he's, you know, he's looking very kind of dandified. He's got this sort of fabulous smoking jacket on and he's got his hair sort of perfectly curled and parted and he's very much presented and presenting himself as the urbane educated literary gentleman and to contrast that and what that sort of portrait tells you about the access that he had to things like people like publishers and and so forth and the sort of conditions that the Bronte sisters had to come up against it's it's just a, a very sort of telling artifact so it it really makes you up and sort of certainly makes me love the Brontes work even more sort of knowing what they had to you know what they were up against in yeah. terms of just getting their work out there and getting published it's I love the, the the fact that there are just so many extra stories that come out of this that you hear about with the authors themselves out of out of curiosity because you I love that the big thing that's coming through from the way you're describing things to me is um all of the stories that accompany these artworks and the company the the books that you've been reading as well have there been you know you've looked at particular artworks and you've gone and suddenly found a book that you've started reading that you've taken joy out of like trying to find out more about this particular area of time where for example a particular artwork has come from yes well uh, certainly I, I did mention a portrait of a woman named uh, Nell Gwynn uh, who I, I knew very little about <laughs> really uh and and there's all sorts of, I mean the exhibition covers you know all of the kind of major phases of British history including um the whole period of uh the civil war and uh the interregnum so the, the you know, execution of Charles I in the 1640s and then the period under Oliver Cromwell and then of course the restoration as well when Cromwell was after Cromwell died and King Charles II was restored to the throne 10 years later so uh, and that's a period of British history that I know nothing about. And I thought, well, you know, where, where's a good, who's a good guide <laughs> to, to uh, 17th century Britain and to all of those, you know, political um, shenanigans and various different kind of conundrums and wars and kings and queens and all of that sort of stuff. Uh, and for that, to that end, I, I started reading the diary of Samuel Pepys, which is a, a I mean, he's so fabulous, incredibly questionable now that we in the sort of me too era Samuel Pepys is not someone who's going to stand stand up <laughs> too well or, or come out too well but I mean he to read his diary is pretty it is you know very very amusing and he talks about all of these people he talks about Oliver Cromwell who you know uh, he was associated with he was kind of indirectly employed by Cromwell for a while he then uh, sort of switches allegiance. And so when Charles II comes to the throne during the restoration, he, he's, he's very sort of closely associated with Charles II's court. And the other thing is that he was a, a great fan of the theatre <laughs> and a great fan of Nell Gwynne's. So uh, to read his diary was a really good way of not just sort of getting a, a sense of that whole sort of span of history that's covered and represented in the exhibition by portraits of specific sitters, but mm. also just, you know, a fabulous read, <laughs> a fabulous <laughs> read as well. And sort of concurrently with reading Peeps' diary, because, you know, it is heavy going. It's, it's, it's like a tome that's... It's a brick. You know, yeah, it's a brick. <laughs> and, um, you know, short of having to sort of keep going back to the footnotes to find out exactly who he's referring to mm. or the end notes rather um in conjunction with reading his diary i read a, a wonderful biography of of peeps by claire tomalin a, a british mm. biographer who's written wonderful books about oh, all sorts of um all sorts of amazing people including mm. jane austen i might add <laughs> uh so yeah things like that which i sort of I needed to sort of educate myself a little bit more about certain areas or certain mm. people in the exhibition. Uh, and then there were other, there are other works in the exhibition, which kind of once again, sort of prompted me to revisit things that I've read before and really enjoyed. And I was talking earlier about the sort of Tudor and um, Elizabethan <laughs> aspects of the exhibition. Uh, so I've been doing a lot of reading around uh 
the artists that were employed by uh, Henry VIII in particular, so I'm reading quite a bit about Hans Holbein, mm. uh, who of course is, among other things, is famous for having uh, painted the portrait of Anne of Cleves. And on the strength of that portrait, uh, Henry VIII decided to make Anne of Cleves uh, his, his wife. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and of course, Anne of Cleves. This is after the execution of um, this is after the execution of Anne Boleyn, and after Jane Seymour, his his third wife, had died. He says, "Oh, I need another one. Who's going to be before?" Uh, and so he sent Holbein out to various different uh, royal courts in Europe, and Holbein came back with portraits of, of you know these women who were prospective mm. wife number four for Henry VIII, and Anne of Cleves was one of them. Henry said, I like the look of her. She'll do. <laughs> Anne of Cleves comes to uh, comes to, to England and Henry sort of sees her in, in, in the flesh for the first time and decides he doesn't fancy her at all. So that, that fourth marriage didn't last very long. But I guess the sort of dark side of this whole story is that uh, Thomas Cromwell, who of course was Henry VIII's right-hand man, and who had engineered or very much sort of promoted uh, the cause of Anne of Cleves as, as wife number four, uh, he lost his head as a result of the, the failure of this woman to, to please Henry. He lost his head for a number of other reasons. But <laughs> uh, so I guess it's a, I became really fascinated with the way that these, these artworks, you sort of think, oh, it's just a portrait who cares but in a way mm. they had they had power mm. and that whole sort of uh involvement of of thomas cromwell in the sort of anne of cleves <laughs> transaction and that that whole sort of history i suppose put me back in the direction of hillary mantel's fantastic books which are centered on cromwell, uh, Wolf mm. cromwell and bring up the bodies and the third novel in the series, which I can't bring myself to read because I don't want Cromwell to die, even though he does, but I, I don't want to read about it happening. <laughs> I do not. I don't blame you one bit. The the mirror and the light. Yeah, it's a, yeah, yeah. It's, it's a, it's definitely a, a very intense book to put it mildly. Um, <laughs> um, this is amazing. I love, I love hearing about the the not just the portraits, but the stories behind them and then the, the literature that you've then gone on to seek out as a result, which is fantastic. Um, we'll finish off this podcast with a couple of fun little questions um, that uh, off, off the back of this. Um, some about, you know, your own reading habits, some about the exhibition itself, just for a bit of fun. Mm -hmm. um, first up, what is the perfect idea of a night with a book or a piece of art for you? Ah. Uh... Definitely a book, mm -hmm. uh, and I suspect I'd be here in the Blue Mountains. It's winter, <laughs> it's very cold, and I'm sitting in front of the fireplace. We've got a, a lovely roaring uh, wood-burning fire <laughs> upstairs. Yeah, sitting there uh, feeling very snug with a nice glass of red wine. And oh, yes. probably a 19th century novel, probably... Jane Eyre or Middle March. <laughs> oh, love it! Every single thing about it, from start to finish. That's that's like my ticking ten out of ten boxes of what I of, of my ultimate night with a book. Um, off the, I know I feel like I, I may have already asked this question, but you've already told so many fantastic stories. I'm tempted to grab one more out of you. What is one story about this collection that just you did not see coming? Totally surprised you. Oh, gosh, that's a good one. The Wow, gee, I'd have to say, and this is going to sound really daggy, but <laughs> the, <laughs> there's this portrait of the Queen, which I'm the, of the current Queen, Queen Elizabeth mm. II, uh, and I think I mentioned at the start, it's a it's a hologram, and you know I'm not a monarchist or anything like that. I mean, I have a great deal of admiration for the Queen. I think she's an amazing historical figure. She's she's incredible, really, but you know it's not like I'm a sort of card carrying. <laughs> royalist or, or anything like that but mm. I think the really wonderful thing about this portrait and perhaps inadvertently is that you get a sense of of how human she is you know mm. 
she's not just this sort of figure that's on tea towels and <laughs> commemorative china. She's uh, she's a you know a living, breathing lady with a, I think a sense of humour <laughs> and a personality. Um, I think the, well, firstly that in terms of what's surprising about the work is that to see it reproduced, it just looks like any other sort of two dimensional black and white photograph. Mm. But being a hologram, it's it's not two dimensional at all. <laughs> in a way, when you see it, it looks three dimensional. And mm. she, uh, it's you know how there's that that sort of old story about spooky portraits where the eyes follow you around the room. Yeah, or yeah, this yeah. Is the portrait where she really does follow you around the room. It's, it's quite disconcerting. So yeah, to see it in the flesh is is quite different to to seeing any reproduction of this particular work. So it was a it was a surprise in that respect, but I think also a surprise when you sort of see the work and you spend some time with it and you, you begin to realise the, the kind of effort and the time that would have gone into making it, not just on the artist's part, but particularly on the subject's part. Mm. So the, it's basically a composite image of something like 10,000 individual frames, wow. that was, uh, individual photographic shots that were made of the Queen. And the fact that she agreed to, I guess, to subject herself to that sort of process and just be open to whatever the result would be, I think that shows to me, like I say, that she's got a, a bit of a sense of humour and she's a good sport, you know, mm, someone mm. who has basically been posing for photographs for the last, you know, 95 years <laughs> or whatever and yet here she is, and this is a portrait that was made for uh, her, I can't remember whether it was the 50th or the 60th Jubilee, one wow. of the two, mm. maybe the 50th, maybe 2002. And, uh, you know, so she was an elderly lady but still quite happy to allow these, the, the creation of this work, which which must have been a real, you know, that must have been a real kind of uh commitment and uh, mm. effort on on her part she wasn't just sort of sitting there sort of uh passively posing for a photograph she was you know a willing participant in this in this quite sort of complicated photographic process mm. how interesting yeah and to have it as a hologram as well would be would be to see it physically in place would be so fascinating mm. um if you could meet one figure from this collection Dead or alive, who would it be and what would you talk about? Oh. <laughs> I don't know if I'd want to meet any of them. <laughs> Could um, be a painter as well. Could be a painter as well if you wanted to meet a painter. Gee, that's going to that's gonna take some thought. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, look, maybe I would... <laughs> I'm not sure I'd want to meet William Shakespeare, but it would be nice once and for all to get to the bottom of whether the portrait <laughs> is of him and who <laughs> painted it. I could undertake to do that. Uh, no, but I mean, there's there's so many amazing people. Um, I've mentioned Malala Yousafzai a, a mm. couple of times. I mean, she must just be an amazing, an amazing person to to be in the presence of and. Um, just the presence of the photo is is so um, inspirational and she's just got such grace and such dignity and you know, to think of what she's sort of lived through, what she's survived and, and how she's using her experiences to, you know, to create this really powerful message about the rights of women and the rights of girls to an education. I think she, yeah, she'd be an amazing person to meet. I was very lucky to see her live. She came to Australia a few years ago, and she was uh, hosted. I think Annabelle Crabb was the was the was the host um, at uh, at the International Convention Centre in Sydney. And just the way she conducted herself and how she spoke, every, and, and in terms of every single thing, um, it was incredibly human. Yeah, like very, just very very open and honest in how in you know in some of the things that yes, she's she is a champion for this, but. She's still, she's still, a, you know, a, a, at the time, an 18, 19 year old girl, she still has the same passions and interests as everyone else. She, she, which I thought was just so wonderful. So fantastic. It was a very, very inspiring scene, you know, seeing her. Um, 
Last question, and I feel like I'm even going to back you into a corner even more on this one. If you could get, if you were getting your portrait painted, mm -hmm. which painter slash photographer from this collection, be it dead or alive, would you want to paint slash photograph you? Uh, Van Dyke, probably. Really? Anthony Van Dyke, yeah. I mean, oh. he's fantastic. Really fantastic. I love, I love the you. Yeah. He was painting, or Joshua Reynolds. Yeah, Reynolds or Van Dyke. Partly because if either of them was painting me, I'd get to wear a really fantastic frock. Oh, nice. <laughs> I love that you were straight to the answer with that one. You already knew. You already said. <laughs> um, so they painted royalty and duchesses and lords and ladies and all of that sort of stuff. That was their kind of bread and butter. So, yeah, you'd have some fantastic bling and a fantastic frock if you were posing for them. Oh, I love it. I love it. <laughs> yes, please. I could honestly talk to you about this exhibition um, all day, but I'm afraid that we have run out of time. Um, thank you so much, Joanna, for coming on, Tell Me What to Read, and telling us about this incredible collection, Shakespeare to Winehouse. It's it's wonderful that the, the National Portrait Gallery in Canberra has been able to acquire such a collection, even for a brief period of time. And we really hope that our, you know, our listeners get along and, and check out some of the iconic paintings and photographs for themselves. Thank you so much for coming on. My pleasure, Nick. It's been great to speak with you. Um, so for all of our listeners, uh, we have a landing page on booktopia.com.au where you can go and check out some of the fantastic stuff that we do with the National Portrait Gallery. Um, and Shakespeare to Winehouse runs until, as mentioned earlier in the podcast, July 17th, 2022. Um, and tickets can be purchased in the link below. Um, you can also be sure to check out the exhibition as well as many of the other wonderful collections uh, at the National Portrait Gallery in, Can in Canberra as well by heading to portrait.gov.au. You can get copies of all the books mentioned in today's podcast right now by heading to booktopia.com.au. It's a good site. You should go check it out for all your book needs. We'll catch you next Wednesday for our next episode. But until then, thanks for listening and never stop reading. Stop reading.